Ima li života poslije smrti? To prastaro pitanje koje još čeka pobjednika s dobrim odgovorom inspiriralo je britanskog istraživača i autora Antonija Pika na znanstveno putovanje. Ali nikad nije uspio stići ni do kakve vrste zagrobnog života. Slalom kroz spoznaje iz suvremene neuroznanosti i kvantne fizike kao i kroz drevne kozmologije i mistična iskustva doveo ga do zaključka da zapravo nikad ne umiremo i da smrt kako je obično zamišljamo nije moguća. Indicije su dosta uvjerljive. Čini se da univerzum od nas doslovno zahtijeva da budemo besmrtni. Što na kraju krajeva ne mora biti nužno loša vijest. A optimizma nikad nije nedostajalo ovdje, na rubu znanosti. Dobro večer. Anthony Pick, autor je više knjiga o pitanjima prirode stvarnosti. Prva koju je napisao zvala se, i zove se još uvijek, Ima li života poslije smrti? Nije riječ o zagromnom životu, riječ je o pitanju postoji li uopće smrt, s obzirom da zanimljive pojave i otkrića vezane u samu prirodu stvarnosti, u kojoj sami svijet više nije nešto što postoji, pa onda ne može ni nestati, ne može ni nastati, ne znamo što je smrt, ne znamo što je život, što uopće znamo. U svakom slučaju, Kasnije godina, naravno, nove spoznaje su pomalo vas usmiravale i u druge teme. Međutim, u ovoj prvoj knjizi, koja je polazišna točka ili da kažemo završna točka, koja je temeljna teza knjige? I like the term ending point because that's exactly what we're talking about here. Effectively, what I suggest is something that I call cheating the ferryman. Because you remember the ancient Greek myth that when you died, you were greeted by a ferry, you'd, 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 you'd come along a river bank and the mists would part and there'd be a ferryman who would come over, Charon, and you would pay him an obolus, little little coin, which you would have, the, your, when you were alive or when you were dead and buried, somebody would have put underneath your tongue. You pay him the obolus and he'll take you back to the, 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 the world of the dead. What is little known is that the legend goes on from there and says that if while you're in the land of the dead that you drink from the waters of something called the river Leith, that's L-E-T-H-E, the river of forgetting, all your memories of your past life will be life wiped clean and you'll be allowed to go back across the river Styx to live your life again. Okay, and I argue that what actually happens is we cheat the ferryman, we never pay him because we never cross the river. And how this happens is it links to a few of the reports that people have had about near-death experience. If you look into the, the, um, the, the, the typologies of near-death experience, the, the, the moody traits, the traits that doctors look for when somebody's had a near experience, they will talk about things like the idea that um, I, I was going towards a white light in a tunnel, I met the being of light, um, I met people I'd known that were alive, um, various other sensations, I felt that time had slowed down. But the element that intrigued me is the idea when people turn around and say, my life flashed before my eyes. It's technically known, because I'm, I'm a professional member of the International Association of Near-Death Studies, and IANS have a term for this, they call it the panoramic life review. Now, I suggest that what happens at the point of death in a real death experience, not a near-death experience, is that a mixture of chemicals are released in the brain as you're dying. Now, it is known, it's known that, the, 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 that something strange happens in the brain at the point of death, or even during times of stress. Now, a lot of readers out, listeners out there will probably know this. You know, you're in a car accident, you get given bad news, you fall over. Time seems to just slow down. It's a universal. People have been talking about it for centuries. This is brought about by a neurotransmitter in the brain, a chemical in the brain, called glutamate. And what happens is, when we're in great times of stress, glutamate floods the brain. Literally, this chemical just hits the brain. And what it does is, it's known to bring about a slowing down of time. So imagine the situation. You're about to die. Suddenly, this chemical hits your brain. And suddenly, your final few seconds, for you, are not a few seconds, or a few hours, or a few years, they're a whole lifetime. 
for instance, have you ever had that sensation when you wake up in the morning, the alarm clock goes off, you go to the alarm clock, you turn the alarm clock off, you, for, you put it on do, doze for a few minutes, you go to sleep, you have a whole dream, and then the alarm goes off again, even though you have had a dream that could have lasted hours. This is because your time perception is subjective to the external reality. So imagine this drug then hits your brain and time just slows down. So suddenly you're in this timeless state. What then happens is your past life memories, the recording of your past life memories, which are encoded holographically within the zero point field, are uploaded from the stru deep structures in your brain and you literally start your life from the moment of your birth in a three-dimensional recreation of your life that is as real as the Matrix was in the Matrix movie, where Thomas Anderson didn't realise, Neo did not realise that he'd been living in an illusion. You start that life again in real time, and as you start that life, you just live it again like a computer game. Like, you know, you've played a computer game, the computer game's come to an end, you start the computer game again. You start to live the life again. The difference with this next, with this recording though, is that because it's encoded digitally from the zero point field, it contains a recording of the outcome of every possible decision you could make. In exactly the same way when you play something like Tomb Raider. You play Tomb Raider, within the CD-ROM of Tomb Raider is the alternative scenario of every single thing that Lara Croft could do. Every turn she could do, every decision she can make. So then you're living your life again, and you live that life again, but this time round, you have a game person, a person that's playing the game for you, who knows your life. This is the voice you hear in your head to not do things this time round. Do you ever get that feeling, you know, where something in your head says, just don't do this, there's something wrong? That was because last time you followed that route and it went wrong. This time round, you follow another route and you live your life in a different way and you follow this, this complete illusion of your life and you get to the end of it again and the same thing happens again and you live it again and again and again. But you're living a computer game of your life and over hundreds or thousands of lives you eventually live the perfect life. And when you do that you're allowed to move on. You move on to whether, whether you die or whether you go into Nirvana, whatever you do. That's when things change. This is very similar to the movie Groundhog Day. In Groundhog Day, Phil Collins, the, uh, he lives the same day over and over again. And in that day, initially, he tries to do all the selfish things, bed the girl, do all these things. As he lives the day more and more, he starts to do good for doing good's sake. He starts to get, as the Buddhists would say, good karma. Eventually, if you remember in the movie, after many, many lives of living that day, he then is allowed to move on to the next day. I would argue that's the book's equivalent of death. Na kraju knjige, a i tijekom knjige, spominjate i bavite se nekim čudnim vidom, možemo to nazvati dualizma najizglednog, koji se pojavlja u mozgu, i koristite pojmove kao što su demon i eidilon. Što zapravo oni jesu i zbog čega su toliko značini u pogledu koje nudite u knjizi? Going back to the analogy I was using before, Imagine that you are playing Tomb Raider, the game, or any first-person computer game. You load the game up, and when you load the game up, you have an on-screen sprite or a, 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 a person on the screen that you are role-playing. That person, you then make decisions for that person as the game player, and that person goes down certain corridors and such like. So Tomb Raider is the best analogy I can use. So you have Lara Croft, running down a corridor, you're playing the game for the first time, she comes into a room, suddenly this huge monster comes out, kills her, she dies. You then choose to go back to the start of the game, and you start the game again. And this time you know the monster's there, and you make her go in the other direction. Now, in this scenario, as you play the game more and more, you get Lara through the game, over many, many games, many, many lives of Lara. When the Lara, from Lara's point of view, she's born, when you switch the game on, she then lives a life until she's killed by the monster. When she's catapulted back to living, starting the next game, all her memories are wiped clean. The, the thing on the screen thinks they're just born. And she lives, but as she's doing so, the person who's playing the game warns her and moves her out of danger. This is what happens in our life. And the being that remembers you've, you've lived this life before and has the memories of the last time you played the game, I call the daemon. 
The being on the screen, the everyday being, the being that it's you and I that calls ourselves I or me, that lives life linearly through time, is called the Eidolon. These terms are from ancient Greece. They're very much the term Socrates had a daemon. A daemon. And Socrates' daemon used to guide him. I don't know if you know this. When Socrates used to go out and it was raining, the daemon would warn him whether it was going to rain or not. This being knew his life. I've got accounts from people around the world now who have this entity in their head that guides, guides them. It can guide as a voice in your dream, or it can guide you as dreams, but it knows what's going to happen and it takes actions to save you. That is the daemon. And when you die, then when you come to the next end of that day, that particular life, the daemon then puts you back to the start again and you live the life over and over again. And each time, the daemon knows more and more about the game of your life and it can help you as you go through your life. So this is how the daemon and the Eidolon work. Uh, koje ste primjere naveli da biste uh, nekako pokazali uh, da se to zaista događa ljudima? Neki su, jednog, jednog ću spomenuti, recimo majka koja je htjela popiti određene tablete za smirenje koje su date njenom djetetu pa je računala da nisu ni za nju loše. Neki glas je rekao nemoj to piti. <clears throat> Ubrzo su stanovilo da se u tim tabletama, to je bilo 60-ih, nalazi neka, nešto zbog čega djeca, a ona je u to vrijeme bila trudna, se rađu bez ruku i nogu i slično. Znači ona je imala svoje vlasto iskustvo nekog glasa u glavi koji je rekao učini to. Potom je bilo ljudi koji su stalno čuli te glasove o kojima ste pričali, međutim na neki način uvijek su mislili da to odraz njihove podsvijesti. Sve do trenutka dok nisu spazili da ti glasovi možda znaju nešto više o njima samima i slično. Kada bismo kroz psihologiju i neurologiju i sve te znanosti koje se pokušavaju baviti svješću i umom pokušali potražiti fenomene koji idu u prilog ovome što pričaju, koji bi to bili? Nešto ih možemo naći u medicini, nešto u psihoanalizi, nešto u onim rubnim događajima poput dežavija koji eto, spadaju pomalo svuda i pomalo nigdje. The, 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 the case you cite is a fascinating one. Um, it involves a woman who, who was about to take some pills that she'd been given by her doctor. And a voice in her head said, do not take these, these are not for you, you are pregnant. Now she at the time didn't know she was pregnant, um, which she subsequently she got discovered she was and she had a son. But what she didn't know was that these pills um, was, were actually thalidomide. The pills that were actually taken and they started in 1957, I think, through to 1961, 62. And at that time, nobody knew that these pills were dangerous because they caused something, I think it's called focalia, whereby the, um, the, 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 the arms don't develop, the hands do, but the arms don't. And then people end up with just sort of stunted little arms or little legs. Now, the, her particular son, he ended up being a very talented artist. If she'd have taken the thalidomide, he would not have followed his talent as an artist. He could have tried, but it would have been much more difficult for him. She did not know that, and neither did the makers, distillers, who, didn't, who, who were initially responsible for the drug, didn't know either. In fact, they'd only found out because a doctor called McBride in Australia had noticed this particular ailment in newborn babies. Um, there'd been more cases in Australia than there should have been. So nobody knew this was dangerous, but this voice in her head did. So the question is, if it is just put down to neurology and the subconscious, the question I still have to ask is, how did uh, that particular lady's subconscious know that this was dangerous when nobody on the planet knew it was dangerous? You couldn't say she'd picked it up from a newspaper or anywhere else. Nobody knew. So therefore, that to me shows precognition of information that wasn't available. But the best example I know of how this model works is a personal very, very personal example of this. Back in the early, the late 1980s, um, I purchased um, a CD, a, a very reasonably priced CD, which had a series of tracks by a particular record label. And it was a free, it was quite cheap. And I took it home and I started playing it. And the third or fourth track in, the sound of the music and that particular track made me think of my own death. And I called in Um, my, my then common-law wife, and I called her in and I said, um, I want that to be played at my funeral, this particular tune. And she said, but it's a very, very happy tune. And I said, nevertheless, I want it played at my funeral. And it's a song called Round of Blues by an American singer-songwriter called Sean Colvin. Fast forward many, many years, 
I'm now living with somebody else, get up with them. And the first thing I do with, with my now present wife, my now wife, is I said to her when we first got together, make sure that in my will we have the fact that this record is played at my death. And again, she said, well, why? It doesn't make any sense. And I said, neither do I, but I associate it with my death. Anyway, back in 19, it would have been 1999, 2000, something like that. I'm driving along the M56 in Northern England on a November night, and it's foggy. Driving along in my car, and in my car, I have uh, an MP3 player that has about 16,000 MP3s on it. They're on random play. So there's a one in 16,000 chance of any one track coming up. I used to play that six or seven hours a day when I was driving. This round of blues track had never ever come up. Driving along in the fog, suddenly round of blues comes on. Bink, I think, this is significant. It's telling me something. What's it telling me? So I decided to swerve my car into the inside lane. As I did so, the car, the lorry in front of me shed, it had a load of crash barriers on the back, you know, for crowd crash barriers. They fell off the back. These would have fallen on my car. I was doing 60 miles an hour. I'd have been killed. The reason that song was so important to me about my own death and my own funeral was in my last run of what I call the Bohemian IMAX, my last run of life, that was the last thing I heard. And when I heard it again in my next run, my daemon said, that is significant. You have to heed that. And it saved my life, which I then survived, wrote the book. Dosta fascinantno iskustvo. Kada pokušavamo znači, se baviti bilo kojom stvari kao što je život poslije smrti, pitanja izvan tjelesnih iskustava ili uopće bilo kakvim psihodeličnim iskustvom, uvijek se neminovno susrećemo s jednim zidom na kojem piše priroda stvarnosti. Sve je odjednom drugačije od onog što smo naučili. Vrijeme nije linearno, prostor se može oblikovati, sve nekako fluidno i, dru- i, i slično. Kroz knjigu ste probali kroz mnogobrojne znanstvene radove i anegdote ljudi spojiti to sve skupa i vidjeti što ćete dobiti. Počeli ste sa, uh, odmah u, u prvom pogledu sa fizikom. Zbog čega i što nam suvremena fizika može ponuditi u kontekstu objašnjenja uh, kako svijet u istinu izgleda ako su moguća iskustva na likovom koje ste upravo opisali? What contemporary physics tells us or what modern quantum phyllis, phyll, physics tell us about reality is that the certain universe that we perceive, the universe in which time runs linearly, the universe that is solid is not. For instance, this table is actually made up of atoms. The atoms themselves are made up of 99.9% empty space. All they are is a little rock hard, little nucleus and little tiny electrons supposedly um, orbiting round. That's the old model of, of what even an atom looks like. The reality is that the, the, the centre of the nucleus and the subatomic particles that make up the nucleus and the electrons themselves are not physical objects in the, the way we understand a physical object to be. They are literal fluctuations in a field of energy. They know this because of certain observed things that subatomic particles do. For instance, they are known that they can be in two places at the same time. They know, for instance, that if you, if you do one thing to one particle, you, you, what you do is you take two particles and you, you what's called entangle them. You, you have them share the same space for a time. Then you, you send them apart and you can send them millions of miles apart. If you do one thing to one particle, the other particle immediately reacts instantaneously. And the only thing they can conclude about this is either faster than light speed communication takes place, or at some deeper level of reality, both those particles are actually a single particle. We just perceive it as two. If that's the same for these particles, it means every particle that makes up everything that we see around us is effectively the same particle. In fact, Richard Feynman, who was one of the biggest um, minds in particle physics in the late 20th century, once postulated that the whole of the universe is just one electron travelling at the light speed of light. Now, if you think about the speed of light, we know from Einstein, at the speed of light, time stops. We also know that a photon of light, no, it's a photon of light, 
At the speed of light, which photons travel at, time stops. For a photon, it also doesn't have any physical place in space. It has no mass. From the point of view of a photon, if a photon leaves the edge of the universe and travels to your eyeball, as far as that photon is concerned, no time has passed. That's the light that's illuminating your face and illuminating my face. These, these particles flit out of existence and into existence by the act of an observation. In other words, we, by observing it, bring that table into existence. This is the mystery of quantum physics. And again, if you ever want to embarrass a particle physicist or a materialist reductionist scientist, ask him to explain the observer paradox. And he'll start flapping around and he will, he will change the subject because this is a huge mystery. Subatomic particles are waves until they are measured or observed and then they become particles. Now, what is intriguing about this is that people think that the subatomic particles, it is only to do with photons, which are kind of strange things. They think it, it's to do with electrons. What is amazing is that there's a guy called Anton Zeilinger at the University of Vienna who for the last 10 years or so has done a series of experiments where he has shown that molecules have exactly this same capacity to come into existence at the act of observation big molecules. One of the molecules is something called Buckminster Fullerene, bucky, a buckyball. It is made up of 60 atoms. This object is a wave until we observe it and then it becomes a particle. Not only that but one of the constituents of chlorophyll which is what makes grass green also has this effect. So it's logical to conclude that every single building block of the reality we see comes into existence by the act of measurement or observation, which means the reality we see around us is not the reality as it really is, and it genuinely is not. What it is is the big question, but what is paramount in all this and what is the basic line of this is the act of the observer, the mind. In other words, mind creates matter, not the other way around. Danas imamo donekle sreću da živimo u vrijeme tehnologije koja nam dopušta da vučemo određene paralele. Primjerice, prim, e, govorili ste o igrici kompjuterskoj koja vam je poslužila kao analogija za ono što se zbiva u ljudskom životu. Na sličan način možemo općenito razmišljati i o ljudskom tijelu kroz e, ideju hardvera, kroz ideju e, e, s, o, radne memorije i slično. I na sličan način e, si možemo predočavati stvari kao što je to recimo moguće uz ideju da postoji virtualna stvarnost danas u svijetu računala, znači jedna stvarnost koja ne postoji, a opet i ljudi viđaju i već možemo imati neku ideju kako bi ovo oko nas mogla biti virtualna stvarnost. Stari ljudi nisu to imali, pa su se morali zadovoljiti pojmovima kao što su Maja, što se dosta neprecizno ponekad pre, prevorilo kao iluzija, ali u stvari više od toga. Jedan sličan e, znanstveni proboj tehnološki je također i hologram koji je opet pružio dobre analogije nekim znanstvenicima. Konkretno e, glasovita knjiga s početka 80-ih e, Michaela Tabota, Holografski svemir, je baš kreće sa ta dva znanstvenika od kojih je jedan fizičar, a drugi je neurolog, neuro neuro nešto, teško je ograničiti njegovo, njegovo područje djelovanja. I oni su svaki sa svojih kraja, jedan iz pitanja istraživanja mozga, drugi iz pitanja istraživanja svemira, došli do pojma holografski svemir. E sad, koje su to odlike holograma koje su oni uočili u svemiru i koje se mogu uočiti na čovjekovom tijelu i na koje načine se sve pokazalo da taj holografski svemir doista ima temelja i zanimljivo je njihove teorije od prije 40 godina. Danas već možemo naći u časopisima kao što su New Scientist i, i drugdje sa naslovnicima poput Is It Universe Holographic i slično. Znači, ideja živi, napreduje i novi ljudi vam obogaćuju čak ponekad i bez znanja o svojim prethodnicima. Koja je bit ideja o hologramskom svemiru koja očigledno na neki način nudi jedan zanimljiv model stvarnosti koji može objasniti mnoge fenomene? It certainly does. I mean, the people you're, you're referring to here is uh, Professor David Bohm, um, who I think was at Birkbeck College in London. Um, he was an American that was exiled after the, uh, the witch hunts in the 1950s in America to do with, with communism and everything else, and he moved to uh, London. And he came up with a hypothesis that the, the universe itself is holographically generated, uh, and that It, it works upon holographic principles. Interestingly enough, at the same time, a guy called Carl Pribram at Georgetown University, who I'm aware that you've actually interviewed, um, Carl 
was interested in brain structures and particularly interested in the location of memory within the brain. And he'd worked with a guy called Carl Lashley for many, many years, trying to isolate what they call the engram, the, the memory place in the brain. And Pribram and Lashley were fascinated because they couldn't find any place in the brain that memory was encoded. And Pribram came to the conclusion that this is because the brain is in fact processing holograms. Now, the reason he came to this conclusion is that, that a hologram, if you take a holographic image and you, you effectively smash it up or you break it up, you would naturally assume that it would be like a jigsaw puzzle, in the sense you break up a jigsaw puzzle and each, each bit of the jigsaw puzzle is part of the larger picture. It contains just a little bit of the information. Holograms are different. If you break a hologram up, each of the parts of the image are in fact the whole image slightly degraded. So in other words, a hologram, the, a hologram, the whole of a hologram, the parts of a hologram contain the whole of the hologram. So this is like one of the things you used to think as a kid. You know, the idea of, is, is the whole of the universe in the tip of my finger? It's because it's recursive. And the idea is that holograms, the part is the whole. In which case there is nothing outside of the universe because the universe is within itself. Now, if Pribram, I think what happened was that Carl Pribram's son accidentally came across the work of David Bohm and the two of them got together. And suddenly they had this huge new model of reality in which a brain hologram is proce processing a holographic reality. Now, what we know about holograms is they are generated by light and usually specifically a form of light called highly coherent light. Now, if you look into the structures of the brain, you will find there are things called microtubules in the brain. And microtubules give off coherent light. And in, when you, a hologram is effectively, you take, it's very difficult to explain how a hologram works, but you take effectively a photograph from two angles using coherent light. And when you recreate it under, la under certain lighting conditions, or laser light conditions, you get the three-dimensional image. You see all the way around it. This is how reality, and this is how the brain processes reality. These little microtubules can create micro-holograms. Now, if this is the case, the brain is processing trillions of micro-holograms, this is what creates this. So we are creating the reality we exist within holographically, and we are doing that digitally by drawing up information from somewhere else. Now, I think this is how, when we are in what I call now the Bohmian IMAX, so this thing I think when you live in your life again, I term it the Bohmian IMAX. And the reason I call it the Bohmian IMAX is a guy called Daniel Dennett wrote a book about 15 years ago called Consciousness Explained. And Daniel Dennett is what's called um, an, eliminative, uh, an eliminative materialist. In other words, he believes that there is nothing conscious going on in the brain. We, we are literally automatons. We are sim simulacra. We, we do not have any go anything going on. It's an illusion. And he said that the reason you can prove this is that if you look at the idea that light is coming in from your eyes, sound is coming in from your ears, and inside your head is this little person who has eyes and ears who is looking at a big computer screen. The problem with that is you've then got to assume the little person in your head also has a little person in his head and a little person in his head. It's called the infinite regress. And what he called this was the Cartesian theatre. I argue that reality is not a Cartesian theatre. It's a Bohmian IMAX. The difference between a theatre and an IMAX is an IMAX, you know, is a huge screen. And these days you can actually have them three-dimensional with 3D. So you have 3D IMAXs. Imagine that reality is a 3D IMAX that surrounds you that inputs information into your head to make you believe that there is an external reality. It's the matrix writ large. It's the idea that's put forward in the matrix, because in the matrix it's supplied that reality is holographic. I found out recently that a group of scientists have managed to fabricate and create a tiny area of the universe, nanometers in length, thermometers in length, really tiny. But that's our level of computing now. There's something called Moore's Law that says that computing power and processing power doubles every, I think it's every three years, something like that. If you calculate that we can do that little bit of the universe now, if computing power continues to grow exponentially as it suggests,
I calculate that within 15 to 20 years, we'll be able to simulate a pit of the universe the size of uh, a microbe. Within years after that, we can simulate something the size of the human body. Soon, we could simulate a universe the size of the universe that would be identical in every way to the universe. Now, who's to say that advanced human beings have not done this already and we're living in it? A guy called Nick Bostrom, uh, I think is at Princeton, a mathematician, he's already modelled this and they've actually said that it is highly likely, it is more likely than anything that we are living within some form of computer simulation. Which goes back to my idea of we are living in computer simulation because we're all living in this final seconds of our life that's stimulated by a holographic generation of images of our life on a huge computer program which can be found in something called a zero point field. Kada pričamo o drugim područjima znanosti, sad se spominjali neuroznanost, fiziku i slično. Međutim, psihologija, psihoanaliza, oni su se davno prije susreli sa mnogim fenomenima svijesti i pokušali ih nekako objediniti. Raznim pojmovima imamo tu od Freuda do Junga do Wilhelma Reicha cijeli niz znanstvenika koji su pokušavali iz pozicije znači, psihe rastumačiti svijet. E, susretili su se sa neobičnim pojmovima kojima su se opet bavili i fizičari, recimo sinkronicitet je tako privlačio e, suradnju psihoanalitičara i fizičara, e, Doppelganger koje ste spominjali, e, deja vu, epilepsija i sl. E, u kom smjeru ta, to područje znanosti osvjetljava pitanje što je priroda stvarnosti i kako se može spojiti sa svim ovim fizikalnim spoznajama. I think one of the major problems in in over the, over the years, particularly in the last 100 to 150 years, is that um, psychoanalysts uh, and psychologists are not actually talking to quantum physicists and neurologists in the way they should be in terms that they're almost parallel processing in terms of information. Whereas certain individuals over the years have actually crossed over and looked at things in different ways. For instance, our site Wolfgang Pauli, the Austrian uh, quantum physicist. Pauli was fascinated by synchronicities and he worked very closely with, with Jung. Now, Wolfgang Pauli, you know, if people out there who know their quantum physics will know that Pauli was responsible for something called the exclusion principle, which is a central part of modern quantum physics. So this guy was a really heavyweight thinker. But he was intrigued by exactly what synchronicities are. How is it that we get rooted coincidences that happen in our lives? And he believed there was something he called the acausal principle, that these things mean something. It's just that we don't necessarily see the signals. So we have synchronicities in our lives that seem to signal things. As you said, the, the, the idea of something called the doppelganger syndrome, the idea that certain individuals see their own doubles. Now, I was surprised to discover that within psychiatry, doppelganger syndrome is known as autoscopy. And people who have schizophrenia literally see their own double following them around. Now, they don't know why they do, but they do. They seem to split into two people. Now, I argue that what is happening with schizophrenics is that the, the way their brain functions is perceiving the holographic nature of reality. A good example of this, a guy called Rainer Johnson, who was an English physicist who emigrated to Australia, I think in the 1950s, described reality in this way in terms of schizophrenia. He said, imagine that you'd lived all your life in the top of an Irish round tower. I don't know if you know, in Ireland they have these tall, thin towers. And in the top, there's normally a room at the top. He said, imagine you've lived all your life in one of them with five windows. The five windows are your senses. And this is how you perceive reality. When you start to experience schizophrenia, it's like you've noticed a, a trap door in the roof. You open up the trap door and you stand on the roof and you see reality as it really is. The way the daemon sees it. The daemon sees the, the whirls and the swizzes of the holographic universe. They see, it sees the digital code in exactly the same way in the start of the movie The Matrix when you see all the green digital code. This is what the daemon sees. He sees the holographic nature of reality. When you acquire schizophrenia, the, the, um, the reducing valve of the brain is opened up to the real reality. And this is why schizophrenics effectively go crazy. Because suddenly they're falling out of time. Time for a schizophrenic doesn't flow in the way normal time does. They see people where they're not. 
A classic example, if anybody wants to understand the viewpoint of a schizophrenic, is the movie A Beautiful Mind. And if you watch that, you will see how when a schizophrenic sees reality, they don't know they're hallucinating. And indeed, what indeed is an hallucination anyway? So we have this kind of reality that our brain processes in a particular way. But it's not the real reality. There's the reality behind the reality. It's something that the Gnostics used to call the Plurama. I don't know if you know, in Gnostic, Gnostic belief systems, the Gnostics believe that we exist in an illusion. The reality, and you mentioned Maya earlier on from the Hindus, but the Gnostics believe that this reality is a, a, an illusion and a creation that we exist within and we're trapped within it. As William Blake once said, if, if, if we could see reality as it really was, if the window, if the doors of the doors of reality were cleaned in such a way we'd see reality as it really is. This is why the doors, the band, call themselves the doors. The same quote comes from Philip K. Dick, the American science fiction author, when he called it the, uh, the, um, the black iron prison, the illusion we live within that we think is real. Like Neo in the Matrix, we need to break out of this and realise that this is not what it seems. But as I say, this is only what modern physics is telling us is a possibility. I'm not saying it's a fact, but all I'm saying is the evidence seems strongly to suggest that it is the case. Drugim rečima, deja vi podvojene ličnosti, doppelganger, sinkroniciteti i mnogi drugi uh, fenomeni bili bi zapravo neke vrsti pukotine u onoj uh, iluziji prirode stvarnosti koja se nama čini da oko nas postoji. Uh, kada već pričamo o iluziji prostora, mogli bi se malo stvrnuti pažnju na iluziju vremena. Naime, još, uh, prije 1500 godina su ljudi poput Svetog Augustina imali što za reći o tome da zapravo um stvara vrijeme. Naravno, u novije doba sve fizikalne formule ne objašnjavaju zapravo zbog čega vrijeme ide od prošlosti prema budućnosti kad je moglo ići u oba smjera. Postoje Bruce Devitova formula kod koje potpuno ispada vrijeme iz kategorije, opisuje jedan bezvremenski svemir, vrlo naliko onom kod iskustva bliskih smrti kad ljudi vide sve u isto vrijeme. Zapravo je to možda bolji opis nego da vide film kronološki. Čini se kao da se sve zbiva u isto vrijeme. No, malo je poznato da u zadnje vrijeme postoje zanimljivi eksperimenti, ponovljivi, čak su privukli u pažnju nekih Nobelovaca kao što je Kemi Čermali, koji su se izložili tim eksperimentima. Ko, a, počeli su sa doktorom Birmanom i doktorom Reidinom koji su veterani istraživanja svijesti, koji su pokazali na jednostavnim eksperimentima da na neki način svake sekunde mi falsificiramo stvarnost i da mogli bismo reći starom vodnim rečnikom vidimo budućnost. Kakvi su to eksperimenti, na čemu se temelje i što govore o prirodi stvarnosti vremena i toj projekciji u našem umu koja bi vreme mogla biti? They are very, very intriguing. Um, Dick Beerman and Dean Radin did a series of experiments whereby they, they, they measured the conductivity of the skin and they had sensors on the skin. Now, as I understand it, when we're in times of stress, the, the electrical conductivity of the skin changes when we're under stress or whatever. And what they did was they placed these, these measurements on the wrists of people who had a screen in front of them. And the screen would show a series of photographs. And the photographs would involve, you know, pictures of, pictures of cuddly kittens and snow scenes and mountain scenery and everything else. But interspersed in these were scenes of car crashes and horror. Without exception, with individuals, when they were doing this, the skin conductivity level would go up or go down, whatever it was the, the, the reaction was, immediately about three seconds before the, the image was shown on the screen, which led them to believe that what was happening was that either reality is buffered before it's given to, reality, given to mar the mind or the observer in the head, the homunculus in the head, or we can, in some specific way, review our immediate future and we know what's going to happen next within three seconds. For instance, I'm quite intrigued why we jump when we hear a bang. We jump before we hear the bang. It's also known that when a car door is slammed, there's a certain distance when the car door and the, the sound cease to be simultaneous because, of course, sound and light are different speeds. But up until that point, we see them as simultaneous, which means the brain, again, buffers information before it presents it. Now, if this is the case, it means that reality is recorded by the brain. It's encoded in the brain before it's presented. Now, recent, the, there's been a, another series of experiments which are even more fascinating than the Beerman and Radin experiments. There's something called the phi phenomenon, whereby if you have two lights, 
one that's red and one that's blue and that you don't know that the, this night is blue here and you switch the lights on and off. As you switch the lights on and off, you will get the impression of one light moving backwards and forwards. A guy called Nelson Goodman in the 1970s asked the question, if the light is red here and you don't know what colour this is here, at what point as the light goes across does it change colour? Now logically if you don't know what the colour is there it should be red 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 till it gets to that point and then it turns green. All human beings that are tested with this see the colour change in the middle before they know what the colour is which can mean either we can perceive the future or the brain buffers information. The general belief system is that we buffer information. In other words, we are delayed behind reality. Our processes are delayed behind reality. Mm. Recent work has actually spread that out to about eight seconds. Now that's weird. Da se vratimo malo za kraj emisije opet na demona i Eidilona. Svojevremeno je na jednom predavanju neurofiziolog Karl Pribran kojeg se spominjalo prikazao jedan schematski prikaz klavira i rekao je ovime se bavi neuroznanost. To su žice, stisnete ovu tipku i ova žica se miče. A ona se zapitao, pravo pitanje je ko svira klavir i od kura stiže glazba. To je ono s čime se neuroznanost ne bavi, ali činjenica je da opet dolazimo do tog nekog čudnog dualizma. Vi ste to nazvali nekakvom vrstom ljudske dualnosti koje u stvari ljudske kulture uglavnom ne uključuju. No, na kraju knjige ipak ste spomenuli da recimo sami aboriđini na neki način u filozofiji i kozmologiji dijele svoj svijet na nekako vrijeme budnosti i vrijeme snova. I općenito su, i sam izraz snova je značajan jer činice da nam snovi mogu puno tog reći o stvarnosti kad vidimo da sanj, novorođenčat sanja, kad vidimo da slipi sanje u boji i sl. Pa se pitamo otkud stižu te informacije. Ali u koji mjeri bi se ta, dakle, kozmologija najstarije živuće tradicije na svijetu, aboriđenske, koja govori o vremenu budnosti i vremenu snova, koje pak podsjećaju na taj implicitni i eksplicitni poredak Davida Boma, uklopila u sve ovo što, čime ste se pokušali nekako dotaknuti u knjizi i skupiti dokaze da je to zaista tako. Well, it's interesting again using the line about reality and I'm remind, reminded of the quotation by the Chinese philosopher Lai Tzu when he said, am I a man dreaming I'm a butterfly or a butterfly dreaming I'm a man? Because this is the idea of exactly when we are perceiving reality, is it a reality that is actually out there? But also the idea of, as you suggested before, the idea of, of reality in time. And because we perceive reality as a linear process, which effectively is entropy, whereby things are going from order to disorder. Whereas at the subquantum level, there is no time. Particles can go backwards and forwards in time. Now, I think time is the most crucial aspect. And in fact, um, last year I published, oh, my, one of my publishers in the UK uh, published a book called The Labyrinth of Time, where I actually expand upon the time elements of this book here and the philosophy of time. And the idea that is time a construct of the mind? And in fact, do we exist in a permanent present? Now, um, Herman Minkowski, who was Einstein's teacher, came up with the philosophy he called block time. And block time is the idea that we perceive time in elements of around about tenth of a second. So in other words, we get an illusion of movement because the eye processes images in the tenth of a second. So we see movement. There's no, arb there's an arbitrary reason for that. There's no, it's an arbitrary number. You could imagine a being that critical fusion facility of the eye was one year. They would perceive reality in a completely different way and perceive time in completely a different way, but it's just as valid a viewpoint as our 10 times a second. That being would see the planet Earth as a spiral going around the sun, which would be a kind of a yellow column, and the Earth would be going around like a spiral, like that. On the surface of that planet, to a height of around about eight feet, would be this pulsating life. Because if you take a time-lapse photograph of this studio, we get up, we walk across the room. Time-lapse photograph would show us as a snake moving across the room. In fact, the Hindus have an idea which was an application of the Minkowski block time, which they call the, the, the Ling Surya, the long body. And they argue that what we are in reality is a long snake-like creature that's very small, gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and then smaller again. Point of birth, point of death. 
From the viewpoint of a being that, seven, that sees life as 70 years as a split second, that's what a human being would be. And each second of our life is a slice of the Ling Surya. And in which case, we are like a block cartoon. So when we think that our life starts at this point and ends in that point, is, is a fallacious viewpoint. In fact, you could bring the two ends round, as I do in cheating the ferryman, and bring them together. In which case you have a circle. In which case you have the concept of the eternal return, the eternal recurrence. Something that Nietzsche talked about, something that people like James Joyce used to write about. Lots of writers, Finn Flan O'Brien, all these writers are intrigued by the idea of the circularity of time. In which case then time never ends because it never started. It's a circle, it's an infinity. A kada pričamo o onom vremenu budnosti i vremenu snova, zbog čega je to jedna dobra paralela sa svim ovim spoznajama kojima ste prije govorili? The, 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 the liminal area, the, 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 the place between sleeping and waking, I believe is of crucial importance because it's known as the hypnagogic state and an associate of mine by the name of Andreas Mavromatis who's a, a Greek guy, has written a book called Hypnagogia, and he deals with the science of this as well. And um, what Andreas suggests, and what I'm suggesting, is that when we are not quite asleep and not quite awake, we can then perceive slightly the reality behind reality. The, the, we, we have a snapshot, and we can move within the alternate dimensions of our own life. So sometimes we might be able to see the future, we might be able to see the past, we might be able to perceive alternate realities. When people lucid dream, when people have out-of-the-body experiences, they are traveling in these alternate realities that are part of this huge, holographic, timeless place. In fact, I'd strongly advise anybody who's interested in the science of timelessness should read a book by a guy called Julian Barber, who's a, an Oxford-educated British mathematician, and it's called The End of Time. And in this, he does the maths of exactly the work I do that I try to popularize. And the idea that time is a block. We travel through it. It doesn't flow past us. It's a totally different thing. It is just there. Zato je zanimljivo da tradicije poput aborigina imaju iskustva gdje se nalaze u prostorima u kojima nema prostora, vremena gdje mogu najzgled telepatski komunicirati, kao da se nalaze u onom implicitnom, uh, eksplicitnom redu koji zapravo je David Bohm spominjao, u onom koji se još nije odvio u stvarnost. Kako oni vide stvari? Well, the thing is, with, as, as you're going back to David Bohm, it's quite an interesting idea which people never ever think about. And Ernest Mack was fascinated by this. Ernest Mack, I think he's a German um, physicist, said, imagine a universe with just one planet. How could you tell it was moving? Because there's nothing it would be moving against. Because people don't appreciate space is empty. Space is nothing. So in other words, would space exist if there was just the Earth and the Moon? There would be space between the Earth and the Moon. But if the Earth and the Moon didn't exist, where does space go? And it's a very interesting philosophical concept. Now what David Bohm said was rather like the holograms Everything that is, is encoded in everything else. It's enfolded into itself. In which case, Aborigines, if it can believe the stories, I mean, these are, these are stories that you hear. It's whether they necessarily are true in reality, because one of the things I found is that if you go back to source material of these things, you suddenly find it evaporates. You know, it's one of these stories that people tell each other, but when you go back to the original source material, it's not there or it never happened. So you have to be very careful about these things. But nevertheless, if this is correct, what they're doing is they're attuning into, as they say, the dream time, the song lines, the, 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 the way in which everything is interrelated. So you and I and everybody else in the planet, we're all one entity. There would be an argument to say that humanity is a single organism. In fact, there's an argument to say that humanity is a single immortal organism, that it's experiencing itself subjectively. Bill Hicks, the American comedian, once turned around and said, breaking news, new, new man on L, young man on LSD wakes up to suddenly realize that all we are are one consciousness experiencing itself subjectively. The idea is we are a unity. 
Humanity consciousness is one single consciousness experiencing itself subjectively. This is the work of two people I'm associated with, Professor Bernard Haish, who is an American astrophysicist, wrote a book called The God Theory, which he posits this thing. Also, there's a guy called um, Ball, who is an anthropologist, who's also writing about this, and he calls it the entheological principle. And it's the same idea that we feel we are separate beings because you and I, there is space between us. But that space is an illusion. In a, in a normal worldview, that space is an illusion. So if space doesn't exist and time doesn't exist, everything is a unity. And this is where David Bohm comes back to, and this is where Carl Pribram comes back to, that it's all this encoded system that we live within. But we feel it as time and space, because they are things that help us navigate ourselves around whatever it is we're existing within. Hvala vam, bolje da završimo ovo prije nego što potpuno nestanemo. U samom slučaju, hvala na gostovanju i do neke sljedeće prilike, recimo kad se dogodi ova knjiga u Hrvatsko o vremenu, onda ćemo se opet družiti. Želim vam sve najbolje. Hvala vama na pažnji. Pitanje od kojeg se krenulo, ima li života poslije smrti? Da se ne pitamo ima li života prije smrti, to je već malo teže pitanje. Ali već samo u sebi sadrže nekoliko pojmova koji se podrazumijevaju, mada možda ne bi trebali. Što je život, što je smrt, tko je taj ko umire, tko je ta svjesnost koja nastavlja postojati. Od mnogih otkrića, neuroznanosti, kvantne fizike, preko drevnih kozmologija i mnogih mističnih subjektivnih iskustava, ustroj svemira kao da nas, od nas zahtjeva, ipak kako je rečeno u knjizi, da budemo besmrtni. Tu nema pomoć. Ali to ne znači da se ponekad ne možemo malo odmoriti od te silne vječnosti. Uz recimo prigodni laku noć.